Right then, let us talk about iodine. Uh, one or two people already commented uh, on Edmodo about this, about what a few things that they know, knew about iodine. Uh, what do we know about iodine, everyone? One of my favorite things about iodine, uh, it has a purple gas. Now, sometimes if they're being particularly la -di da they might say that it's violet rather than purple. Uh, but yeah, violet gas, uh, it's a gray solid at room temperature and pressure, RTP. Yes, well done biologists there. Uh, it's the test for starch, goes blue black. If starch is present or iodine or the other way around as well, we've used it the other way around. Uh, it's got the highest boiling point of the halogens. Now, this is covered in more detail in a different unit boiling points and hydrogen bondings and all that sort of stuff um, so that's covered in the ozone topic of this course which if you've already done that you should be able to explain why it has got one of the highest boiling points of the halogens there uh, what else have we got uh, it's not very reactive it is reactive but it's well yeah it's going to be reactive because it's got uh, in, in the case of iodine 17 electrons on its outer shell um, and that but therefore it's only one away from being uh, having full outer shells and being like stable, chemically stable. Um, so saying it's unreactive isn't necessarily true. What we can do is add a little bit more detail to the answer. It's not reactive compared to compared to the other halogens. It's one of the least reactive halogens, but it is still very reactive. Uh, there's all sorts of really cool uh, other facts uh, going in here. It's named after the Greek word iodos because it's named iodine because iodos means violet that is really cool i did not know that see that's why i love stuff like this we just get to explore and learn a few more like really cool bits i, I like a bit of greek origin there so greek violet ace cool beans good shout there uh it's very common element in seaweed and sea kelp and seafood, uh, it, it's common in the sea. Seaweed, seafood, sea plants, blah, 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 blah. Ooh, uh, there's only, I say only, uh, it's got 37 isotopes. Yeah, I, it's got a few different ways it can be arranged, but only one stable. The rest are so unstable, they only exist for fractions of a second at a time and usually in some sort of crazy, uh, nuclear reactor and physics and stuff uh it's essential for hormone production in the thyroid yeah you can get iodine tablets um to actually take as a as a supplement as a vitamin basically uh to improve thyroid function uh it's diatomic yeah in its elemental form is i2 which is diatomic Oops, slid off the bottom of the page there there we are um most commonly known as being a disinfectant yeah along with a lot of the halogens um all the halogens are toxic and if you get the toxicity right uh you can get it so it is a disinfectant or a antimicrobial agent and things like that uh it's used in seaweed it's used as a catalyst in the production of acetic acid that's cool i didn't know that uh, it's a stain used in medical procedures, yes, uh, because it is um, in its aqueous form. In fact, we can add this. I'm running out of room. Let's add it up here. In its aqueous form, it is sort of uh, brown. And because it's got that sort of disinfectant properties, when they're doing surgeries, what they'll actually do is they'll wipe down the area, uh, particularly in animals. So this, there we go. This is a horse. Hey, it's not coming up on your screen. Good, because it looks like a camel. Uh, there it is. That's a horse. Uh, let's say they were doing surgery on a horse uh, on its stomach. They would shave this area of hair off so it would be uh, less likely to sort of clog up there. And then they'd wipe it down with iodine and that would stain the entire area a sort of brownish colour. It does wipe off eventually, um, but it has the additional property of, yes, staining it that colour but also disinfecting the area as well, which is a great use. Uh, what else have we got? Brown and aqueous, sterilizes water, yes. <laughs> and uh, thank you to the student who has just sent me the link to Wikipedia on iodine. 
thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, you do make me giggle. Great. Some awesome background knowledge there for iodine. Uh, and a previous um, session, what I did with, ask you to do is look up the uses of the different halogens as well. Um, there's no specific set deadline for that. Um, it's just good to have a background understanding of what these things are used for. Having an awareness of it is pretty helpful for you to actually understand what's going on with these things. And it always links back to the properties as well. So uh, it's good to have those. Okay, so let's actually get back to the PowerPoint. Right, so what I forgot to mention in the video that I posted the other day is that this is a specification reference that we are looking at here. So uh, of the OCRB Salters A-level course, um, we're working in the elements from the C section, and this is specification point B, if that helps you track down what we're doing. Uh, so what we're going to be looking at, as I've said before, is the uh, how we get the halogens from different things, specifically the C. Does anyone know what this little picture has to do with iodine then? We have already mentioned it, but I uh, just want to see if anyone has any fun suggestions. Usually when we say this in class, um, people get a bit worried. The big thing about this picture, uh, obviously there is a cute little seal in the middle and isn't that lovely? When I show this picture in lesson without the sort of previous knowledge there, uh, lots of people go, oh my gosh, do we extract iodine from seals? And I'm like, yeah, it's the, it's the tears of the seals. Uh, no, uh, the, the idea of this is this is what we call a kelp forest, okay? Kelp, seaweed, uh, laminiara, I believe is its Latin, Latin name. Uh, there's a few different species and subspecies and things like that, but seaweed has got a very, very high percentage of iodine in. And there we go, there's the picture that we saw last time as well, that that is just kelp or seaweed that has washed up uh, this one's from uh, Scotland, actually. And as we said in the last video, uh, it was rich in iodine and was really good as a fertilizer. So Mr. Bernard Courtois, that doesn't work in that accent, does it? <laughs> so Monsieur Bernard Courtois, il était un homme de chimie, il extractait le iode, parce que c'est très, très bien. I have no idea what I'm saying now. Uh, right, so he got... He got the iodine out of there instead of the nitrates, which is a bit of a shame, but, you know, useful nonetheless. Uh, so uh, there was the whole method there. Hopefully we understood that quite well. Uh, attempts by the YouTubers. There's loads of these since I started this project um, doing this practical. So as I said on the original video, it's only been the last three years that we've actually done this as a practical. Uh, when I first started trying to do it, it, there was no real guidance out there on how to do it or any other YouTubers. Now there's loads of them. Um, feel free um, without destroying your homes. Uh, the videos that are there by the YouTubers, there are they are using things that are available from sort of household stocks, depending on what weird and wonderful things you have in your households. Um, so if you have access to seaweed, go for it. See if you can make some. <laughs> uh, interesting question. Uh, does crispy seaweed from the Chinese count? In theory, yes. Um, but I do believe uh, the frying of it in the oils um, would probably leach out a fair bit of the iodine anyway. So uh, it probably wouldn't give you an awful lot, but you are very welcome to give it a try. Film it and, and find out what you get out of it. That'd be really interesting to see if that does work. And a great excuse for me to get a Chinese. Hmm. Anyway, where I left the video from yesterday uh, was here. So we left it as these questions. So what we're going to do now is have a look through these questions. If you've not had a go answering them yet, uh, please just leave the webinar at this point or pause it or whatever uh, and come back to it later. Have a go at the questions and then review it afterwards as well. Okay, questions. Let's have a look at these then. So what have we got? How would seaweed powder be obtained from seaweed itself? Here we go. So first off, you've got to collect it and then you've got to dry it. Okay, so in some of the videos that you might have seen, um, the drying process, they have left been left out on the side for absolutely ages. Um, like we can leave it for up to a week to dry uh, in a sort of warming place. Or what I've done in the lessons before um, is we just get nutritional grade seaweed and then burn it 
like literally just get it on a metal plate and get a Bunsen and burn the pojibas out of it. Collect the seaweed, dry it. It should get nice and crispy. It does get really nice and crispy. Um, that's not why the Chinese food seaweed is crispy. Uh, that's because they fry it off a little bit uh, and grind it to a powder. So you can get a good old pestle and mortar to it. Uh, you could just get a cooking knife and slice it up with a cooking knife, grind it to a powder using pestle and mortar. And the reason why we are doing this is to break up the cells. So we need all the sort of iodine to be released from wherever it is in the cell that they are actually stored. I, I assume somewhere in the cytoplasm uh, i don't know ask a biology teacher you might be able to find out but it's breaking it up releasing the iodine from the cells so we can actually start processing it okay question the filtrate that you did so it contains chloride and bromide ions as well as iodide ions uh first thought why why might the filtrate contain chloride and bromide in addition to iodide? Why might that actually be there? Yes, those of you who are watching this live, some gorgeous comments coming in there. Yeah, those are elements found in brine from the sea. So brine is just kind of salty water uh, and the chloride, the bromide, the iodide are part of that. So within that, why are the iodide ions preferentially oxidized by the hydrogen peroxide? Well, this again, we kind of have to link back to the idea um, about the oxidation, uh, the oxidizing potential and whether they act as oxidizing agents or reducing agents uh, and link it to the distance between the nucleus and the outer shell of electrons, just like we did back when we were talking about forming the hydrogen halides, we saw then that chlorine and bromine are much stronger oxidizing agents. That's why with the uh, production of hydrogen halides, you've got to use the different acids for when you're making hydrogen chloride and fluoride to when you're doing bromide and iodide here. Um, in this case, bromine is a strong enough oxidizing agent that the hydrogen peroxide is not going to interact with it. Um, but iodine is not. And again, we can link that back to the different structures there. So the attraction here from the nucleus is less shielded for the outer electron. So there's less shielding here. So there's a greater attractive force towards the nucleus. So they're going to be able to attract things more easily. Sorry, bromine there. Um, slightly larger distance, less of an attractive force because there's a greater degree of shielding. And then when we get all the way to here, look at all these layers of shielding. OK, it's going to be very tricky for that to attract an additional electron. Or if in the case of iodide ions, which this one is, because of the greater distance between the nucleus and the outer electron, there is less attraction. Therefore, it's easier for some other chemical, for example, hydrogen peroxide, to come along and steal one of those outer shell electrons. And that again is why, as we mentioned earlier, that iodine is one of the least reactive. Question three, balanced equation with state symbols for the redox reaction between uh, the iodide ion and the acidified hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so what have we got? We have got uh, iodide ion. So iodide is I minus. Reacting with hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2. Uh, and because it's acidified, what I'm going to do just to show that, I'm just going to put some extra H plus ions just at the end there, because that's what the acidified means, that there's another load of H plus ions present. Uh, and what is that going to make? Uh, well, that, that gets with that, that gets with that. So we're going to get the elemental form of iodine and water. Okay, really nice little displacement there. Uh, is that balanced? No, is it Eckers like? Right, let's do this. I H O I H O. One of them, one, two, three of them, one, two of them, one, two, one, two, one. Uh, so let's double that one. So I've got two lots of oxygen, so this bottom 
matches there and there. Uh, I've now got four of them. Um, my odd number of hydrogens on the left hand side comes from this sort of acidified bit. So let's just double that. So now I've got four there. So that matches and that matches. Idine on the right there with two of them. One, um, boom. Nice little simple balancing there. Uh, and state symbols. Uh, what should we have? So the iodide ions are going to be aqueous. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is a solution, so that's going to be aqueous as well. Um, and yeah, your acid is definitely aqueous, so that's AQ as well. Um, the iodine here uh, is pretty soluble, to be fair. So that is much more likely to stay in solution than be given off as a gas. Um, in an exam situation, they might let you get away with having it as a gas. Um, but they might be a bit harsh there and just limit it to aqueous. Uh, and the water over here, water uh, should always be present if it's there as a liquid, as a liquid, okay? Unless it's there as a gas, in which case gas, steam, uh, solid, water, uh, ice, okay? But it should be there as L for liquid. So that is our balanced equation there. There we go. Here's one I made earlier. Uh, question four. What did we have for question four? Um, what colour will the upper cyclohexane layer be? Um, well, cyclohexane is an organic layer. What colour is iodine in an organic layer? The violet purpley colour. Uh, and what does the final step tell you about the relative volatilities of iodine and cyclohexane? So the final step um, in the method that we had, for, as I said, there were a few different methods there, um, was just to kind of leave it to settle um, because the cyclohexane will evaporate very, very easily. Uh, so the idea that we can link to it, so let's link it to volatilities. Volatility is the idea that it'll evaporate really, really easily. If somebody is quite a volatile person, that means that they'll go from zero to 100, like boom, they'll lose the temper very, very quickly. In a chemical term, it's how easily it turns from a solid to a gas or a liquid to a gas. Okay, so there are the answers as well. So cyclohexane is more volatile than iodine as it will evaporate at room temperature, whilst iodine will not. Okay, so that I do believe is it. Job done. Yay, more chemistry done. Uh, next time, what we are going to be doing, we are going to look at uh, bromine, the history of bromine, how bromine sort of came about as a thing. Uh, and there is something very, very cool that I'll show you with that as well. Uh, if any of you have been to the Dead Sea, uh, you might have seen or heard of this effect. It's really cool. Um, okay, that is it for today, ladies, gents, girls, boys, and others. Be gone, minions of science. Um, yeah, there's loads. Um, <laughs> narrowing it down, um, Seneca is pretty good. What they've got is um, OCR A and we're OCR B. Now, the course content is actually the same, but just taught in like a different route. Like we've got elements from the sea, elements of life, ozone. Their, their units don't match up to ours in a similar way. Um, but like the content still the same. Um, so obviously this is a, a teacher account, so it's not quite the same. Um, but if I click on student platform, you'll be able to see um, what you'll be able to see. There you go. So within that, you can go subject, chemistry, uh, AQA, O level, new. Uh, let's go to A level there. There we go, OCR A, A level. Um, now that's not necessarily exam questions, um, but it is sort of work through, uh, little work throughs of the different things. So you'll see here, they've got it as foundations of chemistry first, which most of this is the stuff that we did in Elements of Life um, with a few bits of the math things built into it. Uh, periodic table and energy. Group two was in elements of life for us. Halogens is elements from the sea now. 
Enthalpy changes was developing fuels. So it is the same stuff, just in a different order. Um, so they've got some nice little things. There we go, halo alkanes, substitution reactions. And that all you need to do is click start learning. It'll teach you a little bit and there's like little mini quizzes um, as you go along. So Seneca is, is pretty good for a play around. Um, Maths Chem Tutor or Phys Chem Tutor, I think it's called. That's pretty good too. But what I am going to do is uh, send you lot out um, a few different links. And actually, after each halogen that we do about, so today we've finished doing about iodine, um, I'll send you out uh, past paper questions based on that halogen. Anyway, I'm going. Bye, everyone. <laughs>